we're learning. I think we are about to begin just now. Um, so um, good morning, everyone still. Um, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Uh, for those of you who uh, didn't join us earlier, we are uh, in our session two, which is celebrate the impact, uh, the contribution of immigrant and refugee community here in Oregon. Um, if you are here in the first panel, you may hear a few points where uh, the panelists mentioned that we have many immigrant and refugee here in Oregon who had um, training or education in their previous country. And now they are here, they have all of these talent, the skill, but there's not a concrete system for us to utilize uh, those skills to support that uh, our communities, but also uh, having them support back uh, to our state. So in this um, workshop, we have two parts. Uh, the first one, we have Alani from the American Immigration Council to uh, give us some data on um, what that community looked like here in Oregon, uh, how's that contribution look like, and you know a few ideas on how we can uh, serve the community better. And in the second part, it will be a panelist uh, featuring um, community leaders who get involved in this issue where they can share more about their experience working on uh, advocacy for this issue in Oregon. Uh, so with that said, I will just let uh, Leani kick us off. Uh, Leani. Wonderful, thanks so much. I am going to attempt to share my screen. So one second, please. Okay, can everyone see that all right? I think I, uh, I can see the entire things, including your note and the one on the side and your actual screen. All right, I'm sorry, give me one second. I am not the best millennial. Um, sorry about that. I'm just gonna turn my camera off. I'll figure this out. Yeah. Okay, is that any better? Yeah. Excellent. All right, well, thank you all for sticking with me. It is a pleasure to be with you here today. Um, and I just wanna extend a heartfelt thank you to Senator Jama for having this symposium for the second year and for inviting me to come back to celebrate with you today. So once again, my name is Lani Garcia Torres. I'm the Deputy Director of State and Local Initiatives at the American Immigration Council. And for today, I'm going to start off with a quick overview of who we are at the Council. I'm going to give a quick note on some of the trends we see nationally, and then I'm going to dive in um, to the Oregon-specific data on immigrants and refugees. So who are we? Um, many of you, especially if you were here last year, may be familiar with our body of work as New American Economy. But in January of this year, we had a really exciting development where we merged with the American Immigration Council. And so what that meant is that we brought over our powerhouse research and state and local initiatives and paired it with the council's impressive advocacy, litigation, and organizing capabilities that they've had for over 30 years now. And so now as the new American Immigration Council, we're prepared to empower and help newcomers at really every stage of their journey to belonging, from arrival to citizenship and full belonging in all of our communities. And we're really working toward three main goals. Um, the first is a fair and just and humane immigration system that works for all Americans. The second is a country that understands that immigration um, is one of America's greatest competitive advantages. And the third is inclusive communities where everyone who calls this country home can thrive. And so our state and local team is new to the council, but not new to this body of work. Um, we were established nearly a decade ago at New American Economy, as we saw this real desire from state and local leaders to be more proactive in approaching immigration within their own communities especially as we saw it falling apart at the federal level. 
Um, and so now we're in more than 100 communities in over 35 states in every region of the country from Michigan to Maine and California and even Oregon. And our state and local work um, really focuses on three main pillars. Uh, the first is at the local level with our municipal community and civic leaders. We do this in a number of ways, including partnering really closely with local communities to be more inclusive and welcoming to the immigrant and refugee communities. We also work at the state level, and um, we're really excited to work with PAC moving forward. Um, we work with governor's offices, with statewide departments, with state legislators, and we're, we were proud to work with the folks right here in Oregon to help pass the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Advancement in the last session. And then the third uh, pillar of our work is really with the business community. Through Chambers of Commerce and Business Coalitions, we're able to bring the business voice along and make the economic case for why making sure that we are inclusive to our immigrant and refugee communities and make sure that our policies are really working is so important. And so we use this research to quantify exactly how immigrants and refugees are an economic asset at every level of our economy in every community. And then we use that narrative to bring together leadership across the aisle, across industries, across sectors, across cities and states to really make the case that we need immigrants and refugees for this country to thrive. So let's jump right in. I'm gonna start with a pop quiz. Um, if you had to guess, how many major metro areas would you say grew in this country without any new Americans? So the answer is actually zero. None of the major US metro areas would have grown without immigrants or refugees in the past 50 years. So what we're really saying is that immigrants and refugees are already a fundamental part of the national conversation around innovation and recovery. And even with high unemployment at the height of the health crisis, we still saw workforce shortages um, in critical sectors. And the fact of the matter is that our nation and Oregon specifically are facing workforce shortages and demographic changes. Um, our country is growing older. And what we've seen is that uh, 10,000 baby boomers are re reaching retirement age every single day. And that includes 1.32 million Oregonians who are approaching retirement age, which means that fewer immigrants are left in the workforce. And we also know that new American population is increasing at the national and at the state level. Um, in Oregon's workforce, immigrants and refugees are more likely to be of that prime working age, which we define as ages 16 to 64, than their US born counterparts. And that allows immigrants and refugees to participate more actively in the labor force and contribute to the economy as taxpayers and consumers. We also see that new Americans, including refugees, are helping us fill major gaps. So nationally, 78% of new Americans are working age compared to 62% of US born residents. But despite um, immigrants being less than overall share in Oregon, which is 10% versus about 14% nationally, the working share is actually higher at 80%. And people of working age are critical for filling many of the workforce shortages we've seen. So despite all the volatility we've seen in the past year in the labor market, we're still seeing industries and sectors that need workers and we're hopefully turning a corner. So you might be asking yourself, where are Oregon's new Americans plugging in? Um, in the state, we found that new Americans aren't just filling critical workforce shortages, there, we also see that nearly 15% of immigrants and refugees hold a graduate degree compared to US 13% of US born Oregonians. And we also see that 28% of immigrants and refugees have less than a high school education compared to just 6% of the US born population. So what does this mean? Um, because immigrants and refugees are both more likely to hold an advanced degree than their US born Oregonians and more likely to have less than a high school education, they're really uniquely positioned to fill gaps across the skill spectrum in critical jobs from crop production and service industries to STEM, like engineering and software developing. In fact, while immigrants make up 10% of Oregon's population, they represent 17% of the state's STEM workforce. And so we're seeing how immigrants and refugees are really plugging in in some of these critical and in-demand fields. But new Americans aren't just workers, they're also business owners. Nationally, immigrants and refugees are more likely to be entrepreneurs, generating $88.5 billion in total business income every year. And some of our nation's largest employers were actually founded by immigrants or their children. 
A recent council report found that nearly 44% of Fortune 500 companies were founded by immigrants and refugees or their children. And these companies are a strong driver of job creation. In the last fiscal year, these new American Fortune 500, Fortune 500 companies brought in $7.2 trillion in revenue. So if that were, uh, if that were a large uh, world economy, it would come in just behind China and the United States. And new American Fortune 500 companies also employ 14.8 million people, which is a population that would rank as the fifth largest state in the country. And numbering just over 26,000, um, immigrant and refugee entrepreneurs in Oregon are making a huge economic impact right here in the state. These are business owners, big and small, from one man or one woman outfits to companies with thousands of employees. And immigrants and refugees are critical members of our workforce and our communities, contributing more than $1 billion in state and local taxes. That goes towards funding our schools, paving our roads, making sure the lights stay on. They also hold $11 billion in spending power that can be reinvested into local economies through consumer spending, like eating out at restaurants or going to see a movie or going shopping. And when we zoom in to look at the likely refugee population in the state, we see really similar trends. Um, we see that 97% of the state's working age refugees are in the labor force. And they're contributing not just socially and culturally in our communities on the PTA as um, state senators or as our community board members, but paying $128 million in state and local taxes and holding $1 billion in that spending power I was just talking about. So where are we seeing gaps? Um, we know that many of the largest industries in our country require a certificate or an occupational or professional license. And that's true for some of Oregon's largest industries as well, like healthcare and social assistant or local government, which includes K through 12 education and manufacturing among many others. And we also see in Oregon, as we do in many states across the nation, that there's a growth in demand for workers who have certificates or these occupational and professional licenses. Um, we know that there's high demand for this growth in some of Oregon's largest industries like K through 12 education, social work, healthcare, and manufacturing. And while we know that immigrants and refugees are already helping us fill many of these gaps, oftentimes punching above their weight when it comes to representation as compared to their share of the population, um, there's still a lot of gaps and a lot of barriers in place that don't quite allow for the full participation of all of our community members in some of the highest in demand fields. So what our analysis has found is actually that Oregon has a huge opportunity um, to tackle the skills mismatch, which we often talk about in terms of brain waste. We found that more than 32% of the state's immigrants and refugees are college educated workers, but they're employed in occupations that do not require a bachelor's degree. And so they're really working below the le their level of uh, skill and education. And of that 32.4%, 15% um, are working in healthcare and social assistance, 10% are working in manufacturing, 7% in education, and nearly 6% in transportation and warehousing. So what does that look like? That means that maybe someone that was a, um, a leading cardiologist in their home country is instead working as a nurse assistant or someone that was a STEM engineer in their home country might be that stereotypical example you, you hear about someone driving a taxi. Um, so what can Oregon do in order to support the immigrant and refugee community? One of my personal favorite solutions is uh, publishing economic research. We at the council have partnered with advocates in states from New Jersey to Colorado, to Illinois, to South Carolina to demonstrate the growing demand for workers especially these multilingual and culturally competent workers that we've heard about. Um, we also show how immigrants and refugees are already punching above their weight in those fields to show that while immigrants and refugees are filling, helping us meet these gaps, we really do need to be reducing barriers to encourage full participation. You can also follow the lead of states like Michigan, who has its own Office of New Americans, and they partner across agencies to publish more than 20 licensing pathway guides for professions from barbers and childcare providers to teachers and electricians to respiratory therapists, nurses, and physicians. You can also um, invest in accessible workforce development training and English language learning, really looking, looking at how you can leverage federal funds like WIOA dollars in order to ensure that everyone is getting up to the speed. 
Um, you can follow the lead of states like Illinois, New Jersey, and Colorado that allow for an individual tax identification number or an ITIN to be used as a form of identification over a social security number for many of these professional and occupational licenses. And then you can also look at removing barriers to licensure by recognizing international credentials for international medical graduates, which states like Washington and Colorado have done to teachers, which states like Virginia has done. So um, before I pass it back, um, I wanted to leave a couple of resources with you. The first is our 2017 report on refugees um, that found that refugees outshine even other immigrants when it comes to starting new businesses, taking steps to lay down roots and build new lives in our states by becoming citizens and purchasing homes, among other things. And we're actually hoping to have an update to this very soon, but I can share the link to our 2017 report afterwards. And the other one would be um, our interactive tool called Map the Impact. So at the council, we publish this every year and it has top line data on the demographic and economic contributions of immigrants and refugees at the national level, at the state level, for every con congressional district, for the 100 largest metro areas in the country and for all 3000 uh, counties. And so just a quick note on that, there has been some concern over the 2020 census data and its reliability, and our work depends a lot on the American community um, survey data. So what you'll find there is from 2019 until those 2021 numbers are updated, and then that will all be up to date as well. Um, so with that, I just wanted to thank you again. I really appreciate all your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lenny. I know that we have a panel right after you, but I also want to give um, the space to the audience if anyone have any clarifying question about the data that Lenny just presented or any follow-up question on, on the information you just heard. So uh, feel free to put them in the chat or just raise your hand or, or uh, go and mute it. Senator Lawrence Vance. Hi, Liane. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. It was incredibly informative. I wanted to know, um, at least in my anecdotal experience, I know that a lot of um, immigrant folks come over and go back to school, right? So they might have already had the degrees in their home country, but they come here and get the same degrees again. And I think about the weight of student loan debt on them. Do you have any data that talks about um, you know, the, the student loan debt that um, immigrant and refugees are carrying and, and um, ways that we're helping to alleviate that debt for them. That is an excellent question. That's actually not an area we have delved into yet. Um, and much to my research team's chagrin, I will be taking it back to them and seeing if that's something we could look into in the future. But thank you for raising that. Yes. Uh, uh, I will say as well. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, please I was go. Gonna, ahead. I was going to say on the higher education piece, something that we have seen be really fruitful is partnering with community colleges. And so, a lot of times, what we'll see states do, especially while they're trying to figure out where are these gaps, where are the barriers, and what can we be doing, is partnering with community colleges in order so for folks to be certified. And so while your credentials may not be transferable or while you may have to repeat some of your education, how do we get you in a job that's in your field, which is some of what this licensing pathway guides look at. So how do you know you were um, you were a pulmonologist and, and you can't practice that now. How do we partner with our community college in order for you to get contextualized English language learning classes, but also classes that can count toward respiratory therapy so that you're practicing in your field while you're working on having your credentials transferred over. And so that's an area of huge partnership that we see um, that's very fruitful for states. Thank you, Lenny. And Senator Jam, I saw you raise your hand earlier. I think Lenny just responded to my question, which is around, you know, if you talk a little bit, dive into a little bit more into the Michigan program that they partnered with in terms of relicensing. I don't know if you want to say a little bit more about that, about that, but I think you kind of answered my question around the, what you just said, but uh, do you want to have anything else to particularly about Michigan program? 
Absolutely. And so Michigan, um, Michigan is unique in that their Office of New Americans was established by a Republican governor and they have a very specific workforce focus. So much of what they do is workforce focused. They've worked with their Michigan Works um, local uh, it's like local workforce boards in order to ensure that those WIO funds that I mentioned, which is, I cannot do it justice, but um, for the sake of this conversation, a pot of federal funding, and that can go toward things like English language learning. It can go towards um, job training and skills matching. And so that is something that um, our refugee arrivals have because they are employment authorized and they can avail themselves of those resources. Another thing that they did were those licensing pathway guides that I mentioned, um, and they've also worked really closely um, with folks to pass bills that make sense. So um, they had what they called their barber bill, and it was because they heard they had a large Chaldean community who were barbers in their home. Obviously, when you're fleeing your home, you don't always grab your certification or anything that shows all the hours. And so they were able to basically do a self-attestation and then... Um, able to use a small amount of hours, um, basically OSHA training, things that they would need in order to be up to code here in the US, but not to have to repeat everything to get their cosmetology license. So that's one thing that they've done as well. And then those pathway guides, again, you were a nurse, um, a registered nurse in your home country. How do we get you on the path back to that field by posting an in-depth licensing guide. And I can actually share a, a link to those with Ken so we can share that with all participants so you can get a sense of, of what's possible for the state. Thank you, Lenny. And to answer Leila's question as well, yes, uh, after the event, uh, all of the related material, including presentation by all of the workshop today will be mailed out to uh, everyone who signed up on Zoom. Uh, any other question for Lenny? If not, I think we can just transition to the panel, uh, which will be moderated by uh, Mary. Uh, so I think, Lani, do you know if you will stay for the rest of the uh, event today? I will. I would love to listen. Awesome. Thank you. Then I think that uh, we can loop uh, Lani in during that Q&A session as well, uh, if anyone has some common question later. Uh, so Mary, please take us over. Great. Thanks, Ken. And thank you, Liani. Uh, great information. Yeah, and I hope you uh, stay and maybe answer some questions from the audience later after our panel. So uh, it's good to know this, that this work is being done uh, so broadly across the United States. And so again, thank you. Uh, so I'm Mari Watanabe. I am the Partners in Diversity Executive Director. If if you don't know anything about us, I hope you do, but partnersindiversity.org. Uh, and OCAPIA, um, the Oregon Commission on Asian Pacific Islander Affairs is a part of one of the four advocacy commissions. Uh, and I served on that um, on, uh, well, we did this research that I'm going to talk to you about today that uh, actually Liana did a great job in bringing up a lot of information on already. So. Um, so Partners in Diversity, we actually work with employers to help them with their recruitment and retention of professionals of color. And so back in 20, it was earlier than 2017, about 2015, uh, we were hearing a lot from our uh, employers that it was very hard to recruit uh, from our communities of color. So we wanted to really learn scientific, doing scientific research, why that was. So we embarked on this uh, project to really find out how employers could better recruit in the communities of color uh, and really helping identify and removing any barriers uh, for uh, these employers and our communities to, to meet. So uh, during that work, uh, we actually worked with the Migration Policy Institute in Washington, DC. And it that report identified that there were 55,000 immigrants and refugees living in Oregon with at least, at least a bachelor's degree. And so I think the information that the Liana gave us is, is more updated than what I have, but still uh, the, same, the same issues uh, from that, that most of our skilled labor from immigrants and refugees are not being uh, taken advantage of and are contributing to the brain waste, as mentioned, and also to uh, 
those places that the state and federal government love, which is taxes and adding to that, because if these people were all working at their uh, credential level, uh, then there would be more tax dollars being put into our state and local uh, government. So one of the outcomes of the research that we did was led to Senate Bill 855, which passed bipartisan in 2019. And it was a bill uh, that Senator Dembro led this uh, to really ask the licensure boards in Oregon to find faster pathways for immigrants and refugees with advanced degrees to get recredentialed. Uh, and so it was, it was wonderful that that passed bipartisan in a at a time when we weren't passing a lot of things bipartisan and so but over the last two years uh, a not a, a lot of advancement has been made on actually these creation of these faster pathways so today uh, we will talk about this untapped talent among highly skilled immigrants and refugees in Oregon. Uh, and I, to do that, I want to introduce our panel of leaders. So Andrew McGuff, who is the CEO, Executive Director of Work Systems here in Multnomah County, uh, Lisa Waymuller, who works for ERCO, and Nura M. M. Bagari who is uh, with Portland Refugee Support Group. So welcome my panel. Um, so first I wanna just let all of you just give a quick high level overview of your organizations so that the audience can really understand what you do to contribute to our, our community. So Andrew McGuff, um, who is on the call, can you briefly talk about the work that Work System does to help connect people and jobs? Thanks, uh, Mari. Good, uh, uh, still good morning. Three minutes to everyone. Thanks to uh, Senator Jama for inviting us and to Kian for uh, coordinating all this. This is a great topic and um, we've been uh, working on it for, for a number of years. So Work Systems is, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, Liani mentioned it in her presentation. Work Systems is the, the Portland Metro Workforce Development Board, which means that we're designated by the governor in consultation with local elected officials from Washington County, Multnomah County, and the city of Portland to receive certain pots of federal and state money to help improve the quality of the regional workforce. So our job really is to coordinate those federal and state resources with local dollars, with philanthropic dollars to invest in communities in, in our region to help them uh, acquire the skills that they need to be competitive in the labor market to support regional business. And then the flip side, by doing that, the idea is that we're producing highly qualified people to fill the needs of regional industry and help them uh, you know, grow and, and prosper. So one of the primary responsibilities of our board of directors is in fact to develop a regional workforce plan, which not only sort of lays out how, how the money is intended to be spent, but it also identifies priority populations that um, our board wants to serve in our community. And uh, I'm happy and proud to say that for many, many years uh, amongst those priority populations, our refugees, our immigrants, are people with limited English skills because not only are those populations uh, that can really benefit from these investments and services, but we also see the incredible value that they bring to the community and that the, you know, trying to build on those skills from their home countries, we think is, a, is an economic imperative as Liani po pointed out, the percentages and the numbers don't lie, they're growing. Uh, immigrants and refugees come with incredible skills and incredible perspective that we think really enriches our community and uh, is is a community that we want to continue to focus and work on. And I, I'll, I'll get into some specifics later, but in general, that's our, our job is to coordinate those resources and to invest them in individuals to help support themselves, their families, and the, the regional economy. Thank you, Andrew. So Lisa, ERCO is a beneficiary of the grants that Work Systems distributes. Can you briefly talk about the workforce programs that ERCO man manages to give our audience? 
to give our audience a better understanding of how your organization and work systems work together. Yeah, thank you. And my apologies that I think my internet is cutting in and out, so I may be in and out here and there. Um, ERCO does receive uh, work systems funding for some of our workforce development programs. Um, I manage our workforce development department at ERCO, and um, we have roughly 16 programs that provide workforce development and um, the funding comes from work systems as well as Clackamas Workforce Partnership for the Clackamas region um, and Washington County. Um, so we're serving the, um, the you know, metro area with uh, workforce development in areas that are sometimes industry specific. So finding um, our participants uh, with job placements as well as um, career development and training opportunities in certain industries and uh, providing uh, supports along the way so that barriers are reduced and success is uh, obtained through um, our one-on-one -on -one individualized um, support. Um, all of these programs are designed around a model that is um, guiding our participants with setting career goals and um, that can be long-term and short-term. Um, identifying and overcoming those barriers, creating action set steps to reach those goals, um, and some of these programs are um, connecting with employers and building a bridge into a network and mentorship with industry, local industry uh, professionals uh, to develop their skills and talents uh, alongside our participants. Um, yeah, and that's kind of an overview. Great, thank you, Lisa. Nura. So you are with the Portland Refugee Support Group. Can you give us a brief overview of the work that your organization does? So, um, hi everyone, I'm Nara Magbari. And um, as Mari said, I'm with the Portland Refugee Support Group. Uh, so a lot of the work that we do is post resettlement work. And when we uh, formed about six years ago, we, we came together and noticed that uh, once the refugees were done with the resettlement process, they would basically, you know, be running around lost with regards to what do I do next? And they're used to a lot of handholding and, and everything was done for them. And then suddenly they're on their own. And we quickly realized that there was a deeper issue than just, you know, language barriers or not knowing where you're from. There's this deep trauma that refugees face and deal with on a daily on a daily basis. And that trauma is one of the largest barriers when it comes to success for the refugees here in this community, particularly the adults. Um, and so what we do is we have multiple programs that work with our clients to not only address the trauma piece, but uh, through psychosocial programming, we, we partner them with community members that become friends uh, with these families and become lifelong friends. Uh, one of our models is sit down for a cup of tea and we build trust and we want the partnerships, the community, the volunteers to work with our clients uh, to help guide them through the systems that this country has and which are continuously changing. I mean, as someone who's been here most of her life, I still struggle sometimes just a law changes and you don't even know and you're still working based on the previous law that you thought existed or still existed. Um, we have community classroom where we work with um, refugees in not only learning English, um, but that, you know, um, the kids doing, but working with the kids to do better in school, working with the districts to help deal with refugee children, especially those that, that struggle with different uh, mental health issues, PTSD, anxiety, depression, based on the, um, the things that they've been through. But when it comes to the workforce, uh, we have had a lot of difficulty with the very thing that we're talking about today. And that is we have very highly educated, highly qualified refugees, doctors, dentists, nurses, engineers that are working as cooks and taxi drivers and whatever it is. And you can only imagine the effect of that on their mental health and their psyche when it comes to being something which was considered a very respectable and dignified position and suddenly you're washing dishes. Many people obviously will work and do whatever it takes to help their families, but it's not something that's sustainable, particularly in the increasingly expensive um, state that we're living in. 
Um, we are currently licensed with the state to help with licensing and, and recredentialing of Afghan refugees. Um, and it's quite the process. It's lengthy, it's difficult, um, but, but we're doing our best. And of course that funding right now is just for Afghan. It's not helping the dozens of other uh, refugee backgrounds that we, that we currently serve. So I'm really excited um, uh, with the work that uh, Senator Jama and his team are doing um, I think it's very important that we recognize the skills of the refugees that you all obviously are doing and, and bring them into the workforce uh, with the skills that they have and um, helping develop. And we have, we have ideas and I've, I've worked with DHS um, on these ideas a lot and it's just the funding piece. If we can get that funding piece in, I think that we can make a bigger impact in the refugee community. Great, thanks, Nara. So, there has been some other programs uh, between work systems and and um, ERCO that uh, were done to help implement kind of a fast track uh, um, program so that to get some of our immigrants and refugees uh, back credentialed in their in their line of work. So Lisa, um, a few years ago, work systems did one uh, on immigrant nurse rec recredentialing. So can you describe that program uh, and including like where the participants came from and how you outreached and then the outcome of that program? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Mari. And, um, and Nura touched on a lot of the issues that are dealt with in this program as well. Um, there's a comment in the chat too about a former program at Clackamas Community College. Um, and so I wanna acknowledge that that program was kind of the model that we took with work systems to create um, a program that initiated in um, 2016. It took a year and a half of infrastructure and program development to get to a point where we could start our first cohort in 2018. So, it's not an easy program. And like Nora mentioned, it takes a lot of funding. It is a very expensive um, project. It ranged from a cost per participant from 16,000 to 22,000. So it's not cheap. Um, and with kind of the comment in the chat and in our discussion, it has seen different iterations of success and um, development and loss. And a lot of that is because of the funding that comes and goes. And I think the, the big lesson that we can gain from these experiences is that um, funding needs to come from multiple sources. It needs to be creative and it needs to have uh, buy-in from states, needs to have buy-in from employers, and it needs to have buy-in from community organizations to sustain um, an active and ongoing program. Um, but with that in mind, I'll get into the details. Um, so we started the first cohort in 2018, like I said, with a year and a half of planning, which involved curriculum development, curriculum approval by the OSBN um, in order to be a viable training program for, um, for the nurse uh, reentry program. Um, we had two consecutive years of these cohorts. Um, the first cohort was 16, had 16 participants. The second cohort had 15. Um, and they represented, they represented 15 different countries and about 21 different languages. Um, we had one nurse manager. So she was the head of the entire program developing curriculum um, and arranging um, all of the scheduling and classwork. Um, we also had a program specialist who worked one-on-one -on -one with the participants to um, be, become eligible by the OSBN requirements, by the state requirements, and support in reducing barriers to being successful. So they were managing just the day-to-day -day issues that might come up with the participants um, and their ability to successfully complete the program. Um, it was a very strong program. Um, that was only possible through partnerships with Clackamas Community College, uh, where the program was housed. And um, it had two weekday evening lectures that were from 6 to 9 p.m. So it was um, in-person setting. It was allowing our participants to have full-time day shifts if they needed to provide for their family while they were in the program, which was 90% of our participants. Um, and then they had also one evening of lab work. Um, in 
Clackamas Community, Community College's um, really great lab um, that they offered. Um, so the um, many of the instructors also that specialized in certain um, um, fields within nursing came from the Clackamas Community College um, resource of nurses and educators, and they provided a lot of the structure around um, specializations in nursing. Um, so it was a robust program that um, had a lot of um, support from individuals and um, organizations that made it successful. Um, we had so a total of 31 in those two cohorts, those two years. Years, um, 31 that started the program, 30 of them successfully completed the program. Um, so a 97% completion rate. Um, out of those 30, 24 of them completed and passed the NCLEX or reported to us passing the NCLEX. Um, so that's an 80% success rate. Um, and then we had 83% of those that passed the NCLEX uh, received or got jobs as an RN after completing their NCLEX. So 83% um, successfully were placed in RN jobs and um, filled a lot of gaps that are um, still happening in, in Oregon for um, a lack of nursing um, professionals. So um, it was a very successful program for those short two years. If you look at other um, reentry programs, uh, the success rate is usually 70% or less. So having 80% um, of, our, of our participants complete their and pass their NCLEX is a huge success. Hey, Lisa, I'm going to have you, when, when I ask you the next question, I'm going to have you turn off your camera. So maybe that will help with your internet because um, you are getting spotty. So, yeah. Um, and thank you for that. That's that's like remarkable. And I've, I think that there's like so many other opportunities to do programs like this. Um, but maybe, Andrew, you can talk about that and are there other recredentialing programs? I mean, this nursing one was such a huge success. Um, and do you know of others or are you working on others that could mimic this type, same type of program? Thanks, Mari. I, I mean, it's awesome to have someone uh, with uh, Liesl's background and knowledge about this program. She, she really uh, was key to making it successful. Um, you know, uh, as she mentioned, it's, it was a, it's a very expensive program, and I don't think that uh, Liesl's numbers included uh, stipends uh, that are often required. You know, people can't, it's difficult to just give up all work, and these are full-time programs. The, the INC program, the Immigrant Nursing Credential Program, was 12 months, um, and it was rigorous 12 months you know, it would be very difficult to, to work at the same time for many of those participants. Um, but nonetheless, uh, as you mentioned, 80% uh, success rate, incredible uh, wages and success stories came out of that program. We actually brought them before the legislature multiple times to encourage, um, you know, um, creativity in the licensure process to encourage state investment because again, it's, it's an incredibly expensive undertaking, totally worth it, but in the grand scheme of things, it's a very expensive program. So, uh, you know, in terms of other recredentialing programs, um, you know, the other one that comes to mind like right off of the bat is engineering programs. Um, there, and actually there's sort of, part of the challenge in all this is each industry or each licensure does it sort of differently. So that creates a barrier in and of itself. It's difficult then to, to sort of aggregate, like, well, how do we do this if I'm an engineer or a nurse or a doctor? You know, it's a different, pro it's a completely different process depending upon what occupation you're in. So, you know, things that we can do to sort of try and codify how you might approach uh, recredentialing, I think, would be sort of a policy strategy we, we might want to think about in the future. But in terms of engineering, um, they have they tend to have less emphasis on uh, English language proficiency that healthcare does, which frankly is pretty helpful. 
Um, but where the barriers emerge in sort of like engineering and other technical traits that we found is the whole experiential piece, because I, I don't know who talked about it, but when people flee a country and become refugees, um, it's like they're not bringing their networks with them. They're not bringing their tools with them. They're not bringing uh, things that are essential in the whole uh, licensing conversation. And that, you know, on the job experience is really a critical component of licensure here in the United States. So trying to figure out how can we uh, find ways to help um, recreate some of that experience for, uh, for uh, uh, individuals is sort of one of the challenges we've been trying to, to overcome. Uh, as a result, we have really sort of tried to refocus our efforts on really rapid re-careering services and really trying to get focused on licensure, you know, domestic licensure requirements that frankly, someone with those qualifications in another country could easily connect you and easily achieve over a shorter period of time. And I'll just give an example. Um, CDLs, uh, commercial driver's licensing. Um, we did a, we've done a program recently, it's called Driving Diversity. And we work with the waste hauler and recycling industry in the region to really customize the skills and the training that are needed for individuals to get involved in the recycling industry. And these are really good, high paying jobs. And typically we can get someone licensed and skilled within 12 months. So it doesn't really help on the re-credentialing end, but it does help on the domestic credentialing end, which frankly might be faster and cheaper and a better option sometimes rather than trying to, you know, sort of fight these licensing requirements because it can be a fight. As Liesl mentioned, it was a year and a half. And the other challenge is that, that you don't just have like sort of state requirements and state like industry people. Many of these licensing requirements also have national uh, expectations. So you're not just working at the state of Oregon, you're working at, you know, the US government at the national level. So it just creates a layer of complexity. And finally, I would just say, we have also really um, invested a lot in our community colleges, particularly in what we call vocational English uh, language training, so VESEL. Um, and it's really trying to uh, provide um, English as a second language training, but contextualizing that within uh, industries and occupations within those industries. So it's a way to help people who have limited English proficiency, which happens to be one of the greatest impediments to getting relicensed here, but it helps them focus those uh, English language skills on the occupations uh, and the industry that they're familiar with in their home country. So it really, I think, is a rapid way to get them to a place where they can be competitive in an industry and connect to that industry. Because again, there's all the experiential requirements. And what we found too is if, if we can get highly skilled people into an industry, um, and it may not be at the level that they're accustomed to in their home country, what tends to happen though, is they advance quite rapidly. And especially if we can continue to offer English language learning uh, focused on that vocational um, sector at sort of simultaneous to working in that industry. So, you know, roundabout way of saying, we think there are opportunities, particularly we think that the INC program, the Immigrant Nursing Credential Program is ripe for reinvestment. Um, and, and I want to say one other thing. Part of our model when we went into this program was uh, on the sustainability side to really try and encourage employers to make an investment. Um, and unfortunately, we didn't see the level of employer investment that we had anticipated on the back end to continue the program. What essentially happened is, is when we submitted grants and we looked for resources, 
we were hoping to at least generate about 50% of the costs through employer investments, and we never realized that. So we think that another place that we as a workforce board can turn our attention to is in working more directly with employers and trying to get them to invest resources as part of the sustainability strategy. That's great. Um, and uh, so so maybe we could have uh, Liani pop in because Liani, you mentioned in your uh, your presentation that you've been working with Chambers of Commerce on this. So are there programs that your organization is doing to kind of address what Andrew just said is like trying to get more employers to uh, to be able to invest in this work? Absolutely. And I just, I wanted to uplift that point. It's something that we hear over and over again, even in states where employers are more involved than others. I think part of it is working with your local chambers or when you work with a certain employer and they're part of the chamber, plugging them in to really see this as an economic development and a workforce development imperative. We understand that this is so much more than that. Um, we are working with human beings every day. But sometimes to get that business sector involved, we need to speak their language. And so really for Oregon to remain competitive, you need to attract and retain global talent. Part of that is leveraging the incredible talent we already have right here in our immigrant and refugee communities. And so I wish I had a simple uh, checklist, but I think something we've seen be really successful is just getting in front of the chamber, showing them how it is a workforce and talent solution, and then helping them see where the opportunities are. Um, sometimes it might not be so clear. So with our Global Talent Chamber Network, many times we'll plug them into more federal level fights. Um, it, it usually helps when the federal delegation is hearing from some of the largest employers in those states. But to your point, in, um, in another state we're working in, we really had a meeting between our business community and the refugee service providers to say, where's the gap? What are you seeing that we're missing? And from there, we had takeaways like, Maybe we put together a guide for employers that talks about the different types of employment authorization documents we'll see so that people aren't getting shut out because they don't know what to look for. Maybe when the big EDC is looking for competitive bids, we know that transportation is an issue. How do we explain to that company that wants to come to our state, we need to invest in public transportation or look at employer-based transportation. And so it's the slow ongoing process of continuing conversations, but again, maybe using that language that, that really resonates. Um, thanks, Liani. Um, so I will just put out there for you that uh, my office sits in Portland Business Alliance, which is the largest chamber in the state. So if you'd like to work with them, or uh, I would be happy to, to be a connector. <laughs> so Absolutely. I will be sending you an email shortly. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so I would like to go back to Nura and Nura, you talked about the programs that you've been working with with the Afghan community. Can you talk a little bit more about those and then maybe even add to that, like what are uh, some other of your communities that really need help uh, and in what areas of the job market? So the, the current relicensing and credentialing programs are, we're working with different agencies uh, depending on what the job is that the Afghan refugee is currently seeking or what their background is in. And like I said, it's, just, it's a pretty difficult process. Why? Because there's so many refugees and immigrants <clears throat> already going through those processes. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And, uh, and, and there are immigrants, you know, someone had mentioned it early, the difference between an immigrant and a refugee. There are immigrants who come to this country with money. And so they get almost, um, they have an advantage in terms of how quickly they can get through the credentialing process versus others because they don't have to work. And when you have to work a full-time job to support a family while you're trying to study for these exams, while you're trying to fill out the paperwork, while you're trying to save up three, four, five thousand dollars, which is the cost of a lot of these programmings, it becomes nearly impossible. So for the Afghans, we have funding to help, but that we have hundreds of Syrian, Iraqi, Somali, um, and different families that we serve already that don't have access to that funding. Um, we do have some partnerships where, which are allowing us five to six clients a year for free, but given the huge number of refugees that we serve, it's a, you know, it's a pebble in a bucket. It doesn't do, I mean, it's helpful. I, I'm never gonna look a gift horse in the mouth, 
but it's nothing. You know, I want to see uh, legislation and our, at the federal and state level, look at a cost comparison about how long it takes a refugee family to get out of the welfare system. And that cost versus investing in one year of training, like Andrew mentioned, where you're covering their costs for their living, covering the credentialing, covering their training. You know, we have a family, for example, I have a family of six. They've been with us for about five years now. When I looked at the numbers between their TANF and their food stamp, they're at 120 plus thousand dollars, okay? Had we invested about $50,000 in that family in the first year to help cover their costs of living and food on top of the training, creating nurses, recredentialing a doctor, we're looking at 180 dollars to $200,000 job a year. On top of that, we want our clients, we work with them to give back to the community. We tell them, you know, when you get a job, when you start feeling more successful, that's when you come and share your knowledge, share your expertise, and donate to the organization to help other refugees like you. We're looking at a holistic model here, not just money and jobs. It's so much bigger than that. And I think that's where people need to really understand, and it has to resonate with our leaders that if we don't look at this from a holistic perspective, we're just gonna keep dumping money into programs that eventually are deemed too expensive, or um, you know, we, we don't have the capacity or the capability to keep running the programs. I think an 80% success rate is absolutely incredible. Kudos to you, that nursing program. Uh, I honestly, that's extremely impressive, uh, Liesl. Um, great work there. But like you said, the program stopped. So. The language we need to speak is not just about um, the financial piece, right? We actually have to look at the overall uh, impact of these community members when they're in a healthy mental health, uh, a state of mental health, right? If we're continuously pushing these people to work two jobs, to uh, you know, to stress every single month about how they're going to pay their bills, coming to us or ERCO or any other charity services to help pay their bills, and expect them to pass the USMLE or expect them to pass you know some other credentialing exam, we're asking for for way too much. There's no quality of life anymore, and we end up seeing and we see it among our refugee clients, depression, anxiety, and they just want to quit. They're like, fine, I'm I'm just going to live on welfare, but they don't understand that's going to end eventually right? There's that explanation piece. One thing we do at um, Portland Refugee Support Group is also empowering women in creating and helping create small businesses. And many of these women are, women are unbelievable cooks, as we know. I'm sure all of you have experienced food from different international um, family members or community members. And we have developed um, uh, um, bake sales and bake sale opportunities where we got these girls or these ladies um, uh, licensed, food handling licenses, and they make a little extra income. Well, what we found was really interesting is how empowered these women are to keep going, more so sometimes than the men. And we often look at, you know, how can we help the workforce development for the people who already have skills? But we often fail to think about, um, you know, the, the women or the, the younger adults in the families that really are gung-ho to do something. Mercy Corps used to have a uh, entrepreneur program where they would give a small grant and that that program I don't ended and then it started and then it ended and it's been a little confusing why do they stop why does the funding stop who do we talk to about this who do we engage and if we don't look at that holistic model and develop something where it's a community web rather than just you know you do this and you do this and you do this this is why we're seeing systems collapse because we're not looking at the bigger picture and any way that I can help or we can you know, um, start a discussion about why that holistic model is really important. I think that's where we're gonna see greater success, honestly, and, and more self-sustainable systems. The other thing is having the clients give back in terms of work. You know, We helped you credential at this hospital, you've got to work here for a year or two years, something like that where it helps give back to the, the companies that are supporting these clients on top of giving that person a guaranteed job when they're done with their program. Nara, I think I'm gonna have you run for office. Um, so uh, 
Thank you for that. And I agree with everything you said. I think that that's the one of the things I see and not just in the work uh, force arena is that funders like new programs. So why don't they, but why don't they keep funding the ones that are really um, successful? Sometimes I wonder that in my sleep. Uh, so I actually wanted to ask Andrew, you know, the new $200 million that the state is putting together, like, where do you see like that money being able to help this uh, recredentialing work? I think uh, it's a great pot of money potentially for this kind of work. Um, there's about ninety million dollars that uh, of the two hundred million dollars requested by the governor and approved by the legislature um, for competitive grants. And their competitive grants focused on three industries, healthcare, manufacturing, and IT. So all uh, places where I think um, there's a number of opportunities for uh, refugees and immigrants and recredentialing. Um, they are, a lot of these resources are intended to increase the diversity uh, in those industries as well. And when we first uh, engaged in the immigrant nursing credentialing program, that was one of our, um, you know, the opportunities that we spoke about was uh, refugees tend to represent people of color, underrepresented communities. And it's a great place to make sure that um, those communities are uh, provided opportunities in, in these industries. So I, I would say that keep your eye out. What I have heard is the state on June 24th is gonna issue about $9.8 million in competitive resources, primarily for capacity building for smaller community-based organizations who are interested in building their workforce development chops, if you will. So it's an opportunity, I think, and those are state dollars. So um, they'll need to be spent sooner, but the requirements are such that it's really about helping organizations to build capacity. Subsequent to that investment, sometime maybe later this summer, we should see about $80 million come out for these specific programs related to healthcare, IT and manufacturing with not only trying to fill needs within those industries, which I think recredentialing could do, but also with a focus on underserved and underrepresented populations. So I think it's perfect for this community and we being work systems would be more than happy to partner with organizations or provide advice or input or whatever might be helpful to folks who are interested in applying for those dollars to help make sure that some of those monies come to this, to our community and also come to our community in a way that really helps uh, meet the needs of uh, immigrants and refugees. So I think that's a great spot to think about in the future and to keep our eyes on in the future. And again, I, I put my email and stuff into the chat, I'll do it again. Um, but if people are interested in, in getting some additional insight or I'm happy to share, it will be a state issued RFP though, um, but I'm more than happy to help partner or provide advice as needed, but great spot to look for resources. Lisa, do you know if uh, ERCO is applying for some of these programs? And if you do, what are some of the programs that they are going to be um, trying to get grant money from the state on? Um, we're in discussions with some other uh, community partners partners, um, community colleges, and workforce development boards about programming like this one. Um, we're nowhere near a development stage, um, but we are looking into the funding opportunities and partnerships that can support this. Um, with, the, with our cohorts, we had an advisory board that helped also to kind of build connections in, into the industry and build the support that we needed. Um, one of the major obstacles is clinical placements with that type of program. And um, you know, not the same for other industries, but I think 
on the job training that clinical placements offer is really essential to having that network in the industry, um, having being able to build um, skills while on the job, it was also really important. But in Oregon, the clinical placements are incredibly competitive, really difficult to obtain. We were lucky to get them, um, but it was it was very difficult to get. Um, and that's where that employer partnership and buy-in is really important because without it, Um, we, we could not have completed a successful cohort without that clinical. Um, and so that employer uh, buy-in and um, ownership of, of parts of this program is really important. And that's where, uh, you know, some of the governing boards could be essential in, in moving the needle and, you know, maybe requiring some participation in these types of programming because, um, because in order to grow the workforce, they need to offer those workforce slots. Um, and, and kind of, you know, along with what Nora was talking about with the success of, of the program, part of the, the success with being able to reach that 80% is because it wasn't just a, a training program. It was an individualized training program. We, we provided the support in person. It was not an online training, which is what is currently being offered in, in some states and, and kind of uh, some of the, the opportunities that we see in guidelines for um, this type of programming. Um, there are online trainings, but um, the learning really happens in person and learning the nuances of cultural um, issues on the job. Um, also, they were one-on-one, -on -one, um, small cohorts, individualized life supports. Like Andrew mentioned, there were additions that we had to bring in to provide that holistic support. So it wasn't just a training program. It was um, career support, it was um, transportation support, it was family housing support. Um, there were a lot of things that could have gone wrong, but because we were not just a training program, we were a, a holistic support program, we were able to make sure that they could attend that class they, and support their family, um, have a roof over their heads um, and have the gas in their car to get to that training. So um, those key elements are, essential to having such a high turnout. Um, and we do have a growing list. We have a wait list since the program ended at the end of 2019 of internationally educated nurses who are still looking for nurse credentialing support. Um, we have one uh, referral that we send clients to if they are Spanish speakers. There's one training program in Florida that, that they can attend. Um, otherwise, there's only some online training options, um, NCLEX prep courses that are online. Um, and those are, those are the only avenues that we have to offer them right now. There aren't a lot of competitive programming in, like this uh, available in the States. Um, so there's not a lot of opportunities for internationally educated nurses to seek elsewhere. Um, and we, yeah, we, we continue to get um, participants reaching out to us and asking about opportunities for this program. So we know that the need is still there. We know that, um, you know, skilled talent is still um, coming to Oregon and we, um, and it's not just nursing, of course, that's what I'm talking about today. But as, you know, as Andrew mentioned, engineering is huge. As Nora mentioned as well, um, there's a lot of skilled, um, refugees and immigrants that, that come with um, uh, barriers to finding that connection. And this type of programming can be key to moving the needle along for them at a much faster pace. Thanks, Liesl. Um, well, we definitely don't want any of our, our immigrants or refugees of color leaving the state because that's what my org does. We want to keep them here and grow them. So no one leaves the state. So we have to develop great programs and solutions to this here. Uh, so, you know, one of the, um, because I work with a lot of employers, uh, you know, one of the things I do talk about is, is this work. And uh, what I'm finding, because they are so desperate to find uh, people um, that have skills, 
uh, they are a lot of them are foregoing now the whole Bachelor of Arts or 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 degree in certain areas. And of course, we all know that there are certain areas you can't. But definitely where there's um, opportunities, they are dropping their requirements for uh, college um, degrees, which is awesome. So really looking at skills uh, that they have from their past lives. So um, so I'm hoping that that more um, employers will also be looking at that, looking at their job descriptions and really, uh, um, I call them scrubbing them to make them more accessible to more people. Um, so I think one of the questions that I have um, is that we have uh, uh, this new office that Senator Jajama um, created called the uh, Office of Immigrant and Refugee Advancement, which Tak Salane Gillespie is the new director. So kind of I want to just do a round robin here, like if there's not to give you more work talk, but just uh, just, you know, hypothetically or maybe not hypothetically, it's like, could you all just say, like, if there was one thing that this office could do to help uh, with this recredentialing, uh, what would that be? So let's start with Nura. Uh, wow, thank you. I, I actually wanted to, to mention something. All of the amazing work that everybody's doing, believe it or not, I had no idea existed. And I'm a pretty nosy lady when it comes to resources for my refugees. And so, you know, uh, we our, our uh, uh, ED Peter, who's our new ED, he's been with us for six months now. He's incredible. I wish he was here on this call actually. Um, he's worked really hard to create a network of, of friends who are supporting the refugee and immigrant community. So we know what everybody's doing. We're not double dipping, you know, recreating, reinventing the wheel. But um, for me to work so closely with ERCO and have no idea that this program existed, I don't know, if, shame on me or how that even happened, right? So I think another thing we need to work on as a community is better identifying what everybody does and sharing that information uh, in some kind of database where I can do a quick search uh, because we attend a lot of meetings. All of us attend a lot of meetings. Uh, I'll never uh, forget when Jimmy from ERCO told me, Nura, once you hit a certain level, all you do is meetings. And he was right. Uh, and, and it's so um, almost counterproductive uh, uh, for the skills that we share and we have and the passion we have for helping people. Uh, Talk is one of my mentors. She's helped me through the process of this entire immigration refugee system so much. I, I love and adore her so much. And she, and she helped us when we first started with PRSG learning everything, uh, but we all do so much, right? Everybody talk is now in a new position. She was in another position and then she was with Catholic Charities. That movement happens a lot in the work that we do. How can we stay connected in a way where we're, where we're able to quickly and efficiently realize what everybody's doing so that we can lean on each other rather than stress about how to reinvent that very big wheel that already exists. Go Thank talk. <laughs> yes, go talk. Um, Andrew, why don't you go next? Well, uh, I, I agree with Nura. Like, uh, there's so much stuff that's going on, and trying to figure out how do we coordinate and align that work is really challenging. And I. Um, I would say to Senator Jama, I mean, I'm so appreciative of the future ready Oregon investments, the $200 million. I mean, there's a lot, a lot of resource there. I mean, it's, it's once in a generation resource, to be honest with you. I, I've been doing this work for nearly 30 years now. I don't like to admit that, but I have been. Um, and I, I've never seen this kind of investment, um, in workforce development, particularly. And I worry a little bit uh, because about half of that money, 90 plus million dollars of it is, is for competitive grants. And I understand the rationale for doing that. And I understand the desire to build more capacity. And, but, you know, the immigrant nursing credential program is a good example of a great program that at the end of the day, we couldn't sustain. And I worry that we're gonna make this once in a generation investment potentially, 
and you know come 2026 when the money from the american rescue plan goes away and the general fund money goes away the question's going to be well wh where's the money and th the money's not going to be there i mean if you're looking at the federal government to support this stuff the as uh Liani uh, mentioned earlier, the primary investment from the federal government is called Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act money. That money has declined more than 50% over the course of the last 10 years, and it's on a downward trajectory. So states that are going to rely on that money are not going to be able to solve these kinds of challenges. So I would encourage the legislature and any committee that's focused on you know the use of this fro money and has a particular bent whether it's an immigrant population or whatever that might be a we need to make sure that when grants are those competitive grants are awarded that they are in fact going to serve the communities that we've prioritized for service in the state and that includes refugees and immigrants in our region and that there is connectivity between sort of the ongoing workforce enterprise, acknowledging that there's challenge to that and things need to be better. But at the end of the day, we need to figure out how to sustain these good programs and encouraging those connections on the front end and creating those expectations, I think, is a way that we might position our region and position those populations to be better served over the long haul because fits and starts in service provision don't work. Um, it takes time, effort, expertise, money to just figure out how to organize these things and to create the community connections that are essential to bringing in those populations that we know we wanna serve. I mean, I'm Nura, I would look at you. I know that it's the same in at ERCO is that the most important thing is that relationship with that individual to help them feel trust and um, a level of comfort to work with uh, you to help them help themselves or help you facilitate them helping themselves. That relationship is critical and it takes time and it takes effort and it takes resources. And um, really making sure that we're building and uh, sustaining that capacity, I think, is, is really, really critical. And we have an opportunity, but I think having some legislative oversight there would be really helpful. Thanks, Andrew. And yes, very important sustainability. So, Liesl, I'll have you go next, and then Liani, I'll have you close this out. Great, thanks, Mari. And I would echo what um, Nara and Andrew have been talking about. And I think I've lost track of the original question. So if you would repeat that one more. Yes, so with the new Office of Immigrant Refugee Advancement, so what would you, um, what advice would you give to talk Salonay Gillespie, the new director, on mm -hmm. what she can do to um, help keep this or promote this work? Thank you, yes. Um, I repeat what Andrew had to say about sustainability without, like I've said before, without um, employer buy-in and, um, and sustainable funding, these programs cannot sustain themselves. Um, the relationship that we've built and um, that we provide with one-on-one -on -one support is like I said, the key and the lifeline to the successful outcome of each participant. Um, so being able to build that into the funding and into the structure is really important. Um, and just realizing that the structure building takes time and each time that the funding is ripped away, um, we have to rebuild that. That again. Um, so the more that we can integrate different funding opportunities and supporters, um, the more that the strength and the structure can remain and um, improve year after year. Um, so looking for ways to integrate multiple sources of funding and support is key to um, successful sustainability. 
Yes, great. Thanks, Lisa. All right, Liani. Thank you so much. Um, I think with the benefit of seeing how other offices of this type operate in the other state, what we've really seen is that strategic coordination that we keep hearing a lot about. But talk especially for you based on your background, you're uniquely situated, but your office is also uniquely situated to know what's happening with refugee uh, services, what's happening in the state. And then I would encourage you to continue to engage as everyone has mentioned the business community, really making sure they're at the table to talk through what some of these mismatches are, but also what some of the opportunities are. And so everyone has had brilliant ideas that I can only echo co coordination and, and facilitation. And more, more money. We need more money. So, um, so we have about five minutes left. Does anybody in the audience have a question for our panel? And I can't see you. So can I, can you see the whole gallery? Uh, yes. Okay. I'm going to see if we have any question. Yeah, everyone feel free to drop your question in the chat or raise your hand or just unmute. We may have time for one or two questions maximum. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, Willie? Hi. It's good to be a part of this. I found out about it this morning, but I'm very, very intrigued. I'm out in Rockwood, which our demographic is, to mile radius is 88 cultures, ethnicity, and languages within two miles. So we have a very high population of immigrants and refugees. What drew me in part here was because of that diversity, it gave me an array or it gave me an opportunity to have the world come to me instead of me go to the world in foods. And I think that's one of the things I I'm hearing and been hearing that there's no, to me, there's no reason why that I think to become sustainable to some degree is taking some of those resources and then investing into what they already have to pay for, which is food. Okay, many of those communities, they're purchasing food outside of their community from other parts of the country or the world where they could produce that, manufacture that, and become self-sustainable themselves as well as the community. So I, I, I love what I'm hearing. I'm somewhat surprised of the diversity of it, but sustainability has always been a problem with funding at the beginning. If you have a two to five year window, you automatically should know. It's not gonna be there. It's not. I don't want to say it's a design within the system, but there's ways to be self-sustainable. So I appreciate what I'm hearing. Thank you, Willie. Anybody else have a question? Anne, I see your hand up. Hi. Hi, everybody. Andrew, I've been in this for over 30 years, too, so I feel you. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, my question has two questions, and I don't know if we have time. First question is about accountability. How do we make sure that we are hearing from the participants themselves, from the communities, that these programs, this large amount of money is really working? And um, second question is inclusivity. Uh, being in this refugee community, network for many, many years, I see certain groups not being at the table, certain refugee groups. How do we ensure that all refugee groups are in, included in these, these great opportunities? Good question. Any of our panel like to answer that? Um, I, I would actually, um, that's a great question, Anne, and I put in the chat, uh, uh, and Talk knows this, and anyone that works with me, accountability and oversight are my favorite words because I've personally seen millions of dollars wasted, wasted because they weren't used as promised. And there was nobody to hold the organizations or the whoever the facilitators accountable for where that money went. And as far as who's at the table, you're also 100% right because not as an organization, I'm not aware. And if I am more aware, I'm able to tell my clients, hey, would you like to be part of this program? Would you like to share your ideas? So it comes back down to networking and making sure that we are all at the table first so that we can invite our friends to the same table eventually in order for them to learn how better to 
um, improve their lives and how, as a CBO, how better to improve my organization. We're a small itty bitty organization, but we are like a mighty mouse. We do a lot of work because we focus on, we're really good at mobilizing people, mobilizing our volunteers. But once again, all of these new um, programs and funding and this and that, I usually don't hear about it because I'm small until the funding's already been dispersed or you know, that the decisions have already been made and then the clients that I serve are just left out. So, Anne, that's a fantastic question and it just comes down to better networking and just somehow getting all of us on the same page where we're getting alerts. We're, we're not, you know, we get those emails that get drowned in a thousand other emails. If there's an alert system of some kind where we just, hey, new funding is up. Hey, there's this program. Hey, then it's, I think that's a better way of just making sure that that inclusivity is really part of that master plan. I, I appreciate that question. I would Thank just, you, Nara. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh go ahead. Go I, ahead said I laughed. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to add, and, and this requires some funding, which I'm aware is always in limited supply, but surveys can be a really great way and, and thinking about how to do it in an effective way. So we know just shooting it out in an email isn't always going to work. What does it look like to have it printed and have it at locations that are heavy touch where people are already maybe filling out forms? Can we partner with the Department of Motor Vehicles? Can we partner with local libraries where folks are going? Can we partner with the K through 12 schools to have these surveys there and really be hearing from the community and then have someone that can go through that? and see where it lines up with the metrics we're measuring ourselves against to maintain that accountability. Um, and another thing that we've seen be highly successful has been just knowing who the trusted messengers are. So to Nara's point, not just sending the email, is, it, is the community most active on a WhatsApp group? How can we get to a trusted messenger that's in that WhatsApp group to get the information out or on Facebook or again in the community supermarket? Um, so those are just some, some examples we've seen be helpful in other, in other areas. Thank you, Liani. And thank you, panel. Uh, we are two minutes over time, so I'm going to have to let all of you go. But thank you so much for your insights and wisdom and all the work that you're doing. And Nura, welcome to the rest of us. It's like I hadn't heard of your organization either, so very glad to meet you and hope that we can do some work together in the future. Um, so talk. You do have your work cut out for you. Um, so I'm going to turn this back over to Kian. Yep. Thank you so much, Mary and everyone. Before we close out, I uh, I think San Gemma has some something to say. So San Gemma. No, thank you. I think someone with similar name is actually in the chat room. Just use some language that I don't approve. So I just, just FYI, that's not me. So I just want to let you know that. Yep. Thanks so much, Senator, for clarifying that I did remove that person. Uh, thank you. Uh, but with that said, thank you so much again, Mary. Uh, for moderating the panel, Leani, for your presentation, and all of the panelists uh, for such an insight and informative uh, conversation. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, after the workshop, I will send out a follow-up email to all of the uh, everyone who registered with um, the relatable presentation, including the slide that Leani mentioned earlier and the contact info of all the panelists. Um, so yeah, um, thank you so much, everyone. With that say, uh, we will take an uh, eight-minute break, and we will come back uh, at 105 for our next uh, session. Uh, but thank you so much again, all the panelists.